it takes just the right amount of booze to ride the line between courage and incoherence. Darren managed to hit that perfect ratio and told the following tale because not only does he need to get it off his chest, but he believes it needs to be told. I'm Carol Ann, and welcome to The In-Between, where we tell stories of the strange and mysterious. Strap yourselves in because we have yet another wild ride. It's the summer of 1992, and Darren has decided to live the best summer of his life. He has been fishing and camping and hiking throughout his entire youth. But that is all about to come to an end with two simple words, I do. But before that happens, he plans to make the most of this last summer. Darren leaves his parents' house early that morning with a pistol on his hip and a rifle in his truck. The park he's headed to is just a couple hours away and is usually pretty quiet. He's heard all the wild stories about it and he's anxious to see it for himself. At first glance, Darren is not disappointed. Off in the distance, he can see a mix of open field and dense forest scattered around the rolling hills. To the left of the road is a dry riverbed and Darren makes a mental note that it would make a great trail for him to follow. If it weren't for the occasional rock fence covered in moss, there would be no way to tell that humans had ever even touched this area. Darren feels the familiar thrill of a new adventure as he climbs out of his truck and starts down the riverbed trail. After a couple of hours and a couple of rest breaks, Darren comes to a spot where the creek narrows with three-foot banks on either side. A cluster of trees sits to his left and to the right is an open field of wildflowers. The wind that Darren has felt on his face and heard whistling through the trees all day has quickly disappeared and been replaced with something dark. It's a gut-twisting feeling that comes out of nowhere. He stops and he holds his breath, afraid even to exhale, though he has no idea why and tries to stay positive, not give in to the negativity that feels palpable around him. Then he sees it up ahead. A hundred yards to his right is something dark. It's as if the negativity has taken physical form. There's no movement or sound, yet Darren feels it demand his attention. Slowly, Darren reaches for his binoculars and immediately is hit with a blast of Don't do that. He stops dead for a single moment before continuing to lift them to his eyes. Why didn't Darren listen to that inner voice? Up ahead in the bushes is a thing. A massive, black, hairy thing. He tries to tell himself it's a bear, but he can't lie that well. It's a little after noon and the sun is high in the sky. The downward shadow it casts makes the thing's face darker. Its eyes are cloaked under its massive brow, but somehow Darren knows it is glaring at him. In contrast to that black face, he can see its white fangs. There's no definition to its chest, but he can tell it's incredibly wide. Darren feels sick. His knees buckle and his head begins to swim. As he reaches for the riverbank to steady himself, the creature vanishes. He feels his body relax just a little bit as he thinks, oh, thank God it's gone. But just a moment later, his body tightens once again as he sees it pop its head up again. This time, only 70 yards away, staring with dark, evil intent at Darren through black, vacant eye sockets. He hears it speak in his head. If only you hadn't looked. It stretches up and over as if it's getting a better look. And then it vanishes again. Darren stumbles backward, fighting the urge to turn and run. His mind races. Some people will tell you that they think of their loved ones, or they might say maybe the idea of being part of a missing 411 phenomena crossed their minds. Well, that isn't the case with Darren. He thinks about how this thing might attack him and how bad it's going to hurt. 
He also wonders how long it would take to die and if it would rip him apart or eat him while he still struggles to get away. Every thought that pops into his head is a horror worse than the last. Now, Darren hears it making noise as if it's taunting him like it wants him to be afraid. Is it true that blood is sweeter when adrenaline is dumped into it? Is that why it seems to be toying with him? It stomps and breaks branches and huffs as it again ducks out of sight and moves through the brush. And again, it raises its head only 40 yards away this time. Its details are much clearer now, and it's even more grotesque than Darren had even imagined. Its face is glistening in the sun, and a patch on its chest also shimmers. Silvery strings run from the corners of its mouth. That mouth splits its face in two. It's wide and slightly parted, looking like a sinister grin. Its head and its body are all one. If it has a neck, it is surrounded by pure muscle. Again, it vanishes, and each time it does, it moves so fast that it blurs out of sight. This sick game of peekaboo is more than Darren's mind can take in. Part of him is resigned to the idea that he is not leaving this place alive, while another part, a more primitive part, wants to run. Still, another part of him says he needs to fight. As these options are swirling around in his head, the emotions that go along with them combine to create a head-spinning, stomach-churning mess. Darren slowly starts to back up, afraid to look behind him or even turn his head. The noises are getting louder and closer, and he starts praying. It pops its head up again from 20 feet away and cranes its neck to see him. It towers over the bushes that Darren estimates are about six feet tall. It starts moving out from the cover of the brush and is heading toward the clearing across from him. And Darren begins to cry. This is it. This is how it's going to end. Until his survival instinct snaps him out of his self-pity as the thing disappears once again into the thick green underbrush. Then it steps out of the brush, leaning forward at the waist, its arms hanging at its sides. They are tipped with claws that Darren can't stop staring at. Its huge chest heaves with each quickening breath, like it's psyching itself up for something. Then it goes silent, and Darren's blood turns to ice. As if in slow motion, it bends its knees, leans forward, and throws its arms back, ready to jump. Darren stumbles backwards in a feeble attempt to get out of the way when, boom, something explodes to Darren's left, raining debris over the entire creek bed. Darren feels a gust of wind as this reddish brown blur roars past him, colliding right into this creature's chest. For a brief second, Darren sees nothing in front of him but empty space, but is hit by a scream coming from the other side of the brush, a scream so loud and primal it pulsates through his entire body, followed by deep thumps that shake the very ground with a force he has never known. He rolls over and wills his body to move, but it doesn't respond. He can only lie there, feeling and hearing what sounds like a war zone all around him. When he finally does start to move, to his complete horror, he finds himself drawn to the noise, to the chaos, like a moth to flame. Darren shuffles to the edge of the creek and slowly peeks over the edge. Thirty feet away in the clearing, two leviathans are locked in battle, biting, clawing, clubbing, and tearing at each other. It is primal, raw, and vicious, and Darren clamps his hands over his ears to block out the enraged roars that each bite elicits. And that's when it clicks for Darren. 
the realization that he was saved by a Sasquatch. He's watched all the shows and seen every YouTube video. Darren snaps back to reality, if you can call it that, just in time to see the other creature get its feet up against Bigfoot's chest and with a massive kick, flip the Sasquatch onto its back. The creature leaps on him, biting down on his upper thigh. The scream of pain is even louder than the others, and once again, Darren collapses to the ground, covering his head. The young Sasquatch is now in trouble, trying to shield itself from the endless series of blows coming from the creature. He is losing. Darren knows he has to do something. If that creature wins, Darren will be right back in the crosshairs. And then he remembers he has a gun. There's no way he can kill it, but he can distract it long enough to give the Sasquatch a chance. Darren takes a deep breath and takes aim. The flurry of movement in front of him is making it impossible to get a clean shot. Most of the creature's body is just moving too fast until with almost adolescent pleasure, Darren becomes aware of one body part not in continual motion. It's behind. Darren holds his breath and starts to squeeze the trigger when a massive scream louder than all the others he's heard so far erupts through the trees on his right. Swinging his gun in the direction of whatever this new catastrophe is, Darren beholds an even larger beast crush through the tree line, speeding directly toward the melee already in progress. The monster forgets his current target and prepares for the incoming offensive, but it's too late. The larger Sasquatch has already landed, smashing the creature in its back so hard that its head snaps back and bounces off its hulking back with a loud crack. It goes limp and falls face first onto the ground. The two Sasquatch stand over the creature's motionless body, watching, waiting. At last, a solid kick to the side seems to satisfy them that the monster will never move again. The victorious Sasquatch raises his head and bellows out a mighty roar before dragging his foe's lifeless body off into the forest darkness. Darren stands up and catches the attention of the younger beast who is still a good nine feet tall. It studies Darren as it begins cautiously advancing in his direction. When Darren realizes that he still has his rifle at his shoulder with his finger on the trigger pointing right at the beast, Darren lowers his rifle and the Sasquatch seems to relax a bit. However, it starts to move toward him even faster. Whether it's fear or maybe an adrenaline crash, who knows, but Darren's vision starts to dim and shrink to a tunnel and the earth begins to spin. And the last thing Darren remembers is his confusion as to how the earth could be coming up to meet his face. When he wakes up, his pounding head and rolling stomach make him feel like he's waking up from the bender to end all benders. Darren puts his head between his knees and inhales the cool night air. And then he looks around. He is sitting on the ground, leaning up against his truck with his rifle next to him. Was that all a nightmare? Did he even leave his parking spot? Or did he nod off instead, his mind creating the most epic monster Smackdown movie in his head while he slept? Darren begins to replay the events that he remembers and concludes, must have been a dream. There's no way that was real. And he convinces himself that he never left his truck. He stands up off the ground and turns to get into the truck. He doesn't even really want to go camping anymore. He just wants to go home. That is when Darren sees the huge handprint 
perfectly imprinted on the dust on the hood of his truck, placed exactly where somebody would place their hand to steady themselves while setting something on the ground. Darren freezes as the bombshell of truth of what actually just happened to him explodes in his mind. He has never moved so fast in his life. He gets in the truck, takes off, never looks back, and never tells this story to anyone. For years, that thing has stalked his dreams. And on the bad nights, it catches him. Is that not the most epic of Smackdowns you have ever heard? That's the second story that we've had where Bigfoot wins over Dogman. Maybe Dogman is all bark and no brawn. But then again, I still wouldn't want to meet up with him in a dark forest. But if you want to keep adventuring into high strangeness on your own, click here. Be careful out there. We will see you here again on The In-Between. Bye.